wake up and the memory of the old man starts to fade away. But somehow you're stirring with a new hope. You look around to see where you've landed. Something feels different about this place. Older, but newer. Your clothes feel different, your hair. Everything seems perfect. You grab a newspaper from a street corner and check the date, July 23rd, 1955. But this isn't Hilldale, it's New York City. You suddenly get a strong feeling that you're late for something. You rush up to a building on Madison Avenue, fly up the elevator and burst in the door. So what do you think is all you've got time to hear? Don takes a long drag of his cigarette and quickly downs what's left of his scotch. It's perfect, he says, and you can feel the tension released from the room. A church, an adventure, a gathering of friends, but it just needs one thing. Everyone leans forward in their seats. It just needs Gina Bolton, and here she is. That was awesome. <laughs> wow. Hi, everyone. Um, let me see. There we go. Uh, I'm Gina, and I'm really excited to be in Hamburg uh, and in uh, Germany. I was in Berlin before I got here. Uh, I am a senior product designer uh, on a team called Design Systems, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about what I do uh, for a little company called Salesforce. And sorry, I have to do this, but because we're a publicly traded company, please don't make any buying decisions based on anything I say. Anyway, moving on. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, um, I'm going to start with one of my uh, favorite quotes, which is by Paul Sappho. It says, it used to be that designers made an object and walked away. Uh, today, the emphasis must shift to designing the entire life cycle. Um, so, I'm going to be talking a little bit about product design. Um, product design has some interesting challenges. Um, you're often having to take account uh, support from multiple platforms and devices, and while keeping all that in mind, uh, maintaining quality, craft, and consistency across all these things. And uh, depending on uh, what you're doing, you're often trying to design for scale and maintainability. Um, some of those things that you're scaling across uh, include, you know, the desktop or web, uh, iOS, watch phones, tablets, Android, watch phones, tablets, Windows 8, um, and so on. And so a common tool that people are using right now uh, to do that are style guides. I really like style guides. I talk about them a lot. Um, and style guides are kind of really super popular right now. Um, I'm seeing new style guides come online all the time now, and they've come a long way. Um, so back in 2008, I wrote this um, article for a list apart called uh, Writing an Interface Style Guide. And basically the gist of um, that post was style guides that are often used as design guidelines. Um, they can also be used for a UI or pattern library. And these days they're also being used as a development tool. Um, it's really important um, to keep your documentation current and useful, especially for uh, product design. If you have a lot of duplications uh, in your uh, design work or in your code, it's going to lead to a lot of inconsistencies. Um, the lack of ma maintainability is going to lead to inefficiency. And of course, a lack of clarity is going to cause a lot of confusion. Pardon. So another uh, quick quote that I really like by Nate Fortin is a fractured process makes for a fractured user experience. Um, even if you're not a UX designer, if you're like a developer, copywriter, uh, product manager, like we're all contributing towards a, a user experience in the, in the end, and we want to make sure the process is solid. Um, so a brief history of like my experience in uh, style guides. I actually started out with PDFs at a small agency called Odin. Um, back in Memphis, Tennessee, and I learned very quickly that PDFs are a pain to maintain, especially as you update things, you have to reflow the entire document. Uh, fast forward to my uh, role when I was at Apple, I was working on the online store, 
And uh, we were actually using WordPress as our uh, style guide. And what I learned then was WordPress was only slightly easier than an, um, a PDF. And I was the only one maintaining the style guide, which meant I wasn't really enjoying what I was doing anymore. <laughs> and nobody was really paying attention to it. Fast forward a little bit further uh, when I was working at Engineard. I think some of you have heard of Engineard. Um, this was the first time that I actually um, experienced working on what's uh, being called a living style guide. And a living style guide is a style guide that uses the same code as your application, and it's often built within your application. Um, I really felt like this was like the best, um, my, uh, the best experience with style guides because it was also my first adventure into learning SAS, and I found that SAS and style guides are really, really awesome. It meant that like, I was able to maintain it a lot easier, um, you know, since we're using variables for colors, our color swatches were um, always updated. Um, and having the living style guide for your application meant you had better clarity. Um, if you know, your UI elements that you're building in your style guide are broken in the app, then you know it's broken, uh, or sorry, in the style guide, then you know it's going to be broken in the app. Um, if you are curious about what that process was like, I wrote about it on the Engineer blog. Um, of course, my workflows evolved a lot since then, but uh, it might be worth taking a read of like what our approach was. Um, when I first started at Salesforce, I was actually part of a smaller uh, product that uh, used to be owned by Salesforce called Do. Um, and there I was doing a living style guide using SAS, and it was really great for the web. Um, but I was also in charge of doing a lot of UI design for the iOS and the Android app. And you know, with the web, I can design it in the browser, I can document it in the browser, um, and I can do that pretty quickly. But for iOS and Android, I didn't really have the skill set to do a living style guide for that. So I was doing a lot of what's known as red lines. Um, if you're unfamiliar with what a red line is, it's basically you just spec the design to every detail, all the spacing, the type, the padding, um, Basically, so the developer can just take that and, and do exactly uh, how I expect it. And the process I was doing is I would save these out as PSD files um, and then export it into Dropbox. And then on the repository on GitHub, we used a wiki uh, page that just say displayed all these online specs or redline specs. And then every time I had to make any update to the UI, I had to go through that entire process over and over again, and it was a nightmare, and I did not enjoy that at all. Um, when you're doing redline specs, you're basically promoting designing pages, like on a page-by-page -page, uh, basis. And that's not fun. It's not really the way to go. Um, it's, it's better to think about product design as designing systems. Um, and then with style guides, I often find what what ends up happening is that people will create what I like to call a zombie style guide. And a zombie style guide is basically not kept up to date, and it actually becomes more of a drain on your workflow and uh, ends up causing more harm than good. The only way um, to have a good style guide is to make sure that they're current. If they're not current, they're not useful. So the key thing is to uh, create a living style guide. Um, in order to do this, you have to make documentation a regular part of your process. So if you're designing a new feature or developing a new feature, that's the perfect time to document what you're doing. And if you're revising something or re-implementing something, uh, refactor, uh, re realign it, and then document it. Um, I think it's really important to make sure that documentation is a requirement of the pull request. So if you're going to create a pull request, uh, make sure that it's well documented as well. Um, a little uh, s side project I want to quickly talk about uh, that inspired what um, some of the stuff we're doing now is um, I worked on the SAS website, and because um, you know I love style guides so much, I wanted to do a style guide for the SAS website as well. And so this is what the SAS website looks like right now, and. Um, So this is one of the pages in the style guide. Um, it has like all of the brand colors that you can use. Um, 
the reason I thought it was important to create a style guide for this site is that we had open sourced it. And basically, anybody could contribute to the design, the documentation, uh, the content, um, anything they wanted. And I was a little concerned about maintainability because of that. So like, what if a new color gets added um, for whatever reason for the design? Well, the style guide would need to be updated too. And so I was wondering if the SAS and the style guide uh, could share a single source. And this was back before SAS had SAS maps and a lot of the cool features that it has right now. Um, so this um, was a little clever workaround that I felt like I got a little sneaky with it. Um, and I actually ran it by the SAS core team, and they were like, this is an abuse of SAS. And I was like, well, it works. So what I did was um, the SAS site was built on Middleman, which is a static site generator built on Ruby. And so you're able to store either YAML or JSON files in a data folder. And then you can uh, like create loops and things like on, on that data. And so for the markup for the style guide, um, this is using Haml, but it, it could be whatever. Um, I basically was just looping over name and value pairs for the name and color. Um, so I named them and gave them the hex value. And then the sneaky part, um, oh, I dropped the slide. Um, I'll just have to explain it to you and not show you the code. But the sneaky part I did with the SAS file is that um, I renamed the SAS file from .scss to .scss.erb, which means I can now uh, put Ruby in my SAS files. And so I was generating the SAS variables and generating the classes for the swatches. Um, so unfortunately, I don't have that slide to show you. But Basically, what it means is this page in the style guide is automatically generated from that file. And every time um, a color is added, the style guide is automatically updated, and the work is done. So it's, uh, it remains current. Style guides have to be current to be useful. There's a lot of work being done right now around like uh, automatic gener automatically generated style guides. There's tools like StyleDoco. Um, there's some other ones out there, like uh, there's one called Living Style Guide, there's one called KSS, there's a ton of them out there. Um, and they're all pretty cool, um, but I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing now on my team, uh, the design systems team. And, um, you know, we're kind of sort of rolling our own, and I'm going to kind of talk about some of what we're doing. So I learned very quickly at this company that enterprise product design definitely is a lot more challenging than you know, any uh, product I've worked on before. So I talked before about the multiple platforms and devices. Um, now, like, things that I had to consider, like many products, many features, tons of partners and customers that build on top of our platform, uh, trying to innovate while maintaining, uh, like, a decade of legacy, uh, strong accessibility requirements. Like, we have a lot of government customers uh, and users, and we have to make sure everything is fully accessible. And we also have a lot of customers that customize and configure things, and so all the things we're doing needs to be able to work for that. And you know, we're trying to scale this design system across dozens of Scrum teams, hundreds of developers, and relatively small team of designers uh, in comparison. So how do we communicate design across a large organization like this? A lot of the conversations that you would hear before were like, where can I find the icons? What color is the button border? Where can I find the icons? And you would just hear these same questions happening over and over again. And so you might be thinking about like, well, you know, like are you doing your design specs, using red lines? And uh, you know, there, there was a lot of that. And it's not fun, I can tell you. Um, I wouldn't recommend it. So style guides. <laughs> style guides are a much better tool than red lines. Uh, this was a style guide that, uh, it's actually the style guide that's up right now. And it's a style guide that I saw uh, before I moved over to this team. And I actually really liked it a lot. And it made me want to work on this team. Um, and so it basically outlined like um, the colors that you would use in the app, the typography. Um, and then, it has like a few different icon sets um, that you can use. And it also uh, showed a lot of components, but I don't, 
want to show the entire thing, um, you can get the slides, go to the URL, and you can check it out later. Um, so how do we keep our colors, spacing, sizing, all that stuff consistent um, across all those different products, features, uh, different teams? Um, how do we make our future design changes faster, especially like when you have a lot of different screens, a lot of different variants of those screens, depending on what device that you're uh, designing for? And how do we keep our design system agnostic? And what I mean by agnostic, I, I realize it's kind of funny being in a church saying <laughs> agnostic, but uh, what I mean by agnostic is that a lot of our developers will be building on completely different stacks. Some people are on Node.js, some people are using um, you know, native tools, some people are using um, you know, PHP, JavaScript. Like, there's all sorts of different flavors that people could be using, and we need to try to make our system scale for that. Um, so like a, a phrase we throw around a lot at work is single source of truth. Uh, and we use that for our design specs, uh, our cell guide, our developer. Basically, it means you know, don't repeat yourself, just one single source that's maintained. So if we're just talking about visual design um, currently, um, you know, as a design systems team, we're very concerned about brand consistency and alignment across all our different products. And so uh, things like color, type, borders, spacing, transitions, all that stuff, um, we are now maintaining. And um, we have this tool called Theo, and it's an open source tool we built. It's basically an NPM module. And what it does is you store in a JSON file all those name and value pairs um, for your colors, your type, your spacing, and all that. And it'll generate SAS less stylus variables, uh, Lightning, which is our internal platform that we use, um, and uh, JSON for iPhone, XML for Android, and of course our HTML based style guide. Um, so a little bit of what that looks like. Um, at the top, this is kind of a simplified example. But like if we're naming our text colors, um, all our, our, we, we call them tokens internally. Um, all our tokens are named semantically because like if designs change, we want those names to hold true. So there'll be names like uh, color text or color background input. Or uh, you know, it, it's a name that won't change, but maybe the value might change. So we store it all in this JSON file, and we can give it a description. Um, and then we generate the SAS uh, variable for it. We generate um, stylus, less, uh, like I mentioned, uh, iOS as well, um, some of the other ones. Um, and the style guide is generated. And this is an example of the lightning component that, or the lightning token that we use. So um, what we also have is our designers now specking according to those tokens instead of putting values. So for the ones that are still doing red lines, we just, they just put the name of the token. Um, and that way, uh, as designs change, their specs are still uh, updated. Um, this is an example of an older version of the new version <laughs> of the style guide that I'm working on right now. Um, and this basically shows like a display of, it's basically a reference of like all our tokens. And uh, developers can come here and see uh, what token they need, and designers can also use it. Um, this is a slightly more current version. Uh, we've, uh, we've recently added uh, form factors to our tokens, so some tokens might change depending on, you know, maybe you're on mobile device or maybe you're on um, a large screen. And so um, usually they just cascade mobile and app, but it, then we might have like an override on a specific token. Um, and we also try to um, use uh, the Theo tool I, I mentioned before, it'll take into account different contexts. So if you're using CSS, you're probably either using hex or RGBA. Um, iOS um, might be doing RGBA. Android, you're probably using like an eight digit hex. Uh, so we take that into account when we generate those files. And the same thing with units. So Android is probably gonna be using like SP or DIP, um, where CSS might be using REMS, EMS, or pixels. Um, in addition um, to all that, we've also started generating sketch swatches for our designers to use so that they always have a very up-to-date version of our color palette, so when they are doing designs, they can use that as well. So what this all is leading to is basically no more hard-coded values. 
uh, and that's like really important. We're even writing tests in our framework that uh, will detect if you're hard coding a color or hard coding a value in, um, and it'll fail until you make sure that it's pointing to the correct token. Um, it also means, especially on the scale that we're working at, no more proliferation of inconsistent styles. And a part that I care a lot about is no more having to contact every single dev team just for a minor color change. Um, this is something that might happen a lot, like, you know, you know I mentioned accessibility is a strong requirement. Um, if a test runs and finds that a color isn't contrasted enough against the background, like a text color, um, it'll throw a failure and um, you know, it won't build until that failure is fixed. And so it used to be you'd have to contact like, so many different teams to like, change that color. Now I change it in that JSON file that we maintain. And then when the developers you know, run their build, uh, they get that new color and the work is done. So pretty awesome. Um, feel, please feel free to check it out and give us feedback because we, want, we really like this tool and we would like to see other people using it and telling us like, how we can improve it. Um, so that's one piece of it. Uh, we also have our, all our assets um, from our style guide um, stored as SVGs in a repository. And then those assets display in our style guide automatically based on uh, the repository. And it also means, again, when the developers run a build, um, they're going to get the new icon set. So if we update an icon, we don't have to send all the, um, the different sized versions of it to all those teams. Like, uh, the build process will actually generate, uh, you know, if they need rasterized versions, they'll generate that. If not, they'll get the SVG and it stays up to date. Um, and then like, the like if we do a color background for some of our icons, we actually store that as tokens as well in the JSON file and generate what's needed for that. So basically what that means is a change in one place changes everywhere. Uh, and it's been helping us maintain a truer consistency. And the really cool part that I think is really exciting is it's been improving our collaboration between UX and engineering. There's this uh, really grumpy developer that I work with who's worked at Salesforce for, he said, 9.5 years. And he said this is the first time like, he's really felt like UX and engineering are really collaborating. And that makes me really excited. Um, finally, uh, another tool that we're recently uh, now working on is a CSS framework. And the initial goal of this framework was to kill the red lines. Red lines are painful. Nobody enjoys doing them and try to uh, educate and train our designers to start uh, designing in the browser. Um, so that's something we're currently working on now. And of course, it, it consumes all those things that I mentioned before. Um, a common thing that you know, we're constantly deliberating on is naming conventions, which is um, always a debate in almost any project. Um, the only advice I would uh, give here is that I think clarity is way more important than brevity. Uh, whatever system you use, just please make sure that people can look at the class name or look at what you're doing and know exactly what it does. Uh, there's so many uh, different methodologies. Some people love object-oriented CSS, atomic design, where it's like the atomic um, atoms, molecules, organisms. Uh, the block element modifier method, uh, SMACS, the scalable modular architecture for CSS. And I don't think like, you should have to really choose between one of these things. I think you can kind of combine these and sort of do all the things. Whoa, I skipped a slide. Ah, there it goes. Ah, hold on. I had a funny one in there. <laughs> There it goes. OK. Uh, so that's kind of the method that we're using, <laughs> um, which we're jokingly calling Ubema Smacks. So um, the way that we've got our stuff organized right now, um, obviously, you're going to be bringing in probably some vendor stuff, uh, like normalize. Um, we have what we are calling dependencies, which is basically um, anything that is needed for your framework that doesn't really compile on its own. So these are things like functions and variables and mixins. Um, the core, oops, accidentally pushing the button. Um, the core is basically your core elements, like your typography. Come on. Yeah, there you go. Uh, the typography, um, you know, 
media objects and things like that. And then your components are as you're starting to build up. And then we've got things called utilities. And I'm going to go into that in a second. Uh, the process we go through for building a component, um, because we're kind of rolling our own thing and um, trying to make it work on all these different platforms. Uh, let, let's use a media object, for example. If you're unfamiliar with what a media object is, it's basically um, what's uh, the name for like when you have an image next to text and you see this pattern everywhere. Um, so you would have like the media figure, you'd have the media body wrapped inside a media object. And you might even have variations on that, like this is top aligned, you might have center aligned, you might have the reverse, you might center that, you might even do a double uh, setup or center that. So the way we organize um, our components, so we have a config file and that's where we might do things like mark things as dev ready or GA or it's still you know in progress. Um, and uh, we also put our documentation, we're uh, building this on React so um, we have it set up where we can either do markdown or JSX depending on what complexity we need. Um, the markup um, which is a JSX file that will spit out what the markup is that you'll see in the uh, style guide and uh, the the style sheet, which is uh, a SAS file. And so um, every component basically has a base class, and then you can have your optional flavors. And so this is a pretty, like we have some more simple ones. This one's a little more complex, uh, but the way we would organize it um, is we'd have our base, or, and then like the centered version, the double version I mentioned, and the reverse version of the media object. Um, anything specific goes in those um, folders. But each of those folders have the same setup of config, uh, documentation, markup, and style. And then on the global level, those same things again. So you might have like a global context and then go more specific. Everything doesn't have to be this specific. It just depends on what you need. But then uh, we generate our style guide based off of that. So um, we have our description. Um, and then we show our. Um, component example and you can switch the form factors to see how it responds. Like I mentioned before, we have tokens that might change, so you'll see that change happen. And then we show the, the markup and the style underneath that. And then um, you can kind of scroll down and see like any different like variants or flavors of that component. Um, as I mentioned, we're building using SAS but we have some teams that don't build SAS, so we've got it set up where we build it for SAS on our end, and most people will use SAS, but then um, for people internally that use Lightning, we kind of generate what they need um, for their setup. And so we don't have to do the work twice, we just do it all through an automatic build process. And we have a lot of extensive testing. <laughs> Um, utility classes are something that has become very important for us. This is not something I would do on a personal site because it's kind of like a lot, but for uh, a site on this level, I, I realize it's very necessary. And so an example of that is like headings. Uh, headings can vary a lot depending on context, like the hierarchy, H1, H2, H3. And one of our strong accessibility requirements is that we have to maintain the proper hierarchical I have a trouble with that word, hierarchical order. Um, but we don't know what context this component might get built in. It might be an H3, it might be an H4. So we do utility classes. So we'll have a class for heading small or uh, different styles. And uh, what we found is this has led to better consistency and a lot less duplication because all our components are built using these utilities. And so it means like if we see that you're building styles for font size, line height, color, it's like why aren't you using this utility class? You would not have to write all that code because it already exists. Um, and it also means um, our design specs, I've noticed, are starting to get a lot more aligned and uniform, which is really important for what we're doing. And it makes me a lot, happy, <laughs> a lot happier to see um, that our process is getting better, our workflow is getting faster, um, and I'm super excited about this. And if you're interested in this, please come talk to me about it later. 
Um, one of the guys that I work with that has helped build some of these tools, um, his name's Sunke. Sorry if I butchered it, but he's actually from Hamburg. Uh, he wrote an article about it called Living Design System on Medium, um, and basically talked about the process, you know, building Theo and why we did it. And then I did a follow-up article from more of a designer's perspective called In Search of a Living Design System. So feel free to read this later. Um, and I always like to leave on this quote because I like it. Uh, it says, be regular and orderly in your life so that you may be violent and original in your work. Um, so that's pretty much it. You can get the slides. Um, I'll tweet them later. If you're in San Francisco at any point visiting, I run the SAS meetup, uh, SAS and front end meetup. Uh, let me know and I can let you know if there's an event happening or if you want to speak, I can even plan one around your visit. Uh, that's it. Thank you.